we adjourn the meeting. And uh, it is now 2.30. This is James Kuntz, who has joined us. The public has not seen these folks' resumes. So um, if you'll start just at the beginning um, with a little bit about yourself. But uh, the process is going to be that we have about six questions each that we will ask of you within this hour. And we take turns. I start with Commissioner Beauvais doing the second question. and. Commissioner Burke following up the third, and then we continue. The first questions and the last were from uh, developed by the commissioners, and there are questions that the public submitted that we are asking as well. So, if you'll um, tell us a little bit about you and your background, what attracts you to this position, why do you want this job, what experience you have that you feel qualifies you. Okay, well, great. Well, thank you for the opportunity to interview. Uh, my background, briefly, at least educational. Uh, I have a BA in economics, minors in government and history from uh, Eastern Washington University. And then I have an MPA, a master's in public administration from the Evergreen State College. So that's my uh, educational credentials. After getting out of graduate school, three years at the Port of Benton, I uh, was the assistant port manager there. Uh, managed the Richland and Prosser airports, two small GA airports, and uh, uh, managed most of the real estate for the Port of Benton. They actually had quite a bit of real estate. And then from there, off to the Port of Walla Walla. And uh, I've been there 26 and a half years. Um, uh, 26 years of that as the executive director. I originally went as the airport manager, and six months later, found myself as the executive director of the Port of Walla Walla. So, uh, I've had a great run at the Port of Walla Walla, thoroughly enjoyed it, uh, and I think the Port of Walla Walla is considered within the port industry one of the high performing ports uh, in eastern Washington. I feel good about that. Uh, it basically takes uh, really good port thinking commissioners, and we've had a lot of really good port commissioners in Walla Walla. A great staff to work with, motivated, capable, and uh, we've just worked really well. So any accomplishments that I talked about today is really a reflection of a team made up of the Port Commission, uh, really good Port staff, and uh, quite frankly, a supportive community. So, uh, so why am I interested in this position? Um, obviously, I think it's very unique to be in any one position for 26 years, and so it is a good time for some change. And so. My criteria in looking at what I wanted to do, I'm 55, I've got another good 10 years in me that I want to work and be productive. I want to go to a place that my skill set can make a difference. And so when I leave, I want people to say, that executive director made a difference. And so here's my you know, thoughts about the, the, the Port of Port Angeles. Um, you have an airport. Uh, I know airports very well. Uh, the Walla Walla Regional Airport is a commercial service airport. We basically saved Alaska Airlines. Uh, uh, they were about ready to pull out, and we rallied the community. Not only have we retained commercial air service, we have grown it, and we've grown it substantially. And so uh, I'm very proud of that achievement, and I think uh, I can be a huge asset in uh, bringing commercial air service back, and hopefully we can retain it. I'm really glad this port's working on that, because I just think one of the things that we have unique in Walla Walla, and in Clallam County, we're both rural counties. We are not at the Commerce Center of downtown Seattle. And so it takes a lot of effort, a lot of work, creativity, and quite frankly, risk taking in order to do economic development. I think Pat Jones knows that as well as anybody coming from the Moses Lake. And so, so I think I can help a lot on the airport. Um, I have a very strong marketing background, and I think that that's one of the things that uh, I can bring here. I know that uh, you have uh, industrial parks, and uh, uh, the Marine Trades Industrial Park is very exciting to me. Uh, I have developed industrial parks from the point of purchasing the property, putting the utilities in, most importantly, marketing it so you get new investments and new jobs. And so uh, I've done that on numerous occasions. If you have time, I can tell the relic story, which is a really good story to tell. Um, you know, obviously I did some research on the uh, report here. I think there's a committed and talented staff. Uh, I like that. And the other thing I looked at, quite frankly, very hard, was your balance sheet. Uh, if I'm going to come in and do economic development and be the leader, you've got to have a good, strong balance sheet. And uh, your report does, and you should be congratulated with that. You've got solid revenues. Uh, I know you want to diversify it, but you have solid revenues. 
uh, uh, your reserves are actually very good, and your your, your debt is uh, uh, very reasonable. So you get you get a strong balance sheet, and so uh, those that have run this port and, uh, and the commissioner should should feel good about that. So um, I look forward uh, to uh, asking you know uh, answering other questions. But it came from a high performing Eastern Washington port, which is rural and remote from the commercial port. We have something very similar here in Port Angeles, uh, and uh, I think I can bring my talents to, to uh, bring new jobs and new investment. That's what we need in this community. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The next question is, the prosperity of any business line is dependent on adjusting to changes in the external environment. What emerging opportunities and emerging threats do you see for the Port of Port Angeles? Well, I guess let's let's talk about uh, opportunities first. Um, I, and I'm very excited about marine trades. I think uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. And the reason why I like that, I mean, fundamentally in any economic development plan, I'm a big person about business retention uh, and keeping the businesses that you have. And you already have some marine trades already, and so it makes perfectly good sense to me that you want to grow that. I mean, you've got a piece of property. Uh, uh, that is ideally suited. So I think that is, is a good opportunity. The other thing uh, that I would comment on, I'm doing this a little bit in Walla Walla, uh, thank goodness to the internet and to uh, new communication tools, you can be very successful in a very small rural community and do high talented, high valued work. And uh, so I think that's an opportunity uh, that is uh, something that we should take advantage of. I will tell you that in Walla Walla, uh, we are starting a software cluster of all places in Walla Walla, Washington, because basically we're taking advantage of the overheated Seattle market, where mid-sized and small-sized firms cannot keep talent. Can't do it. And we talked a company into starting up in Walla Walla a software development company. And his thought is, is that he has a percentage of his workforce that would love to bike and, and be close to Starbucks, which we have one, and actually own a home, be able to drive home uh, at lunch. And so uh, he is starting a software development cluster in Walla Walla. And uh, I'm excited about that. If he can do it there, that's something we should be talking about doing here uh, and getting out of the route, rat race at downtown Seattle. I'd like to see that ex uh, uh, explored. You know, I think the, the, the challenges on the challenge side uh, for me would be uh, uh, you know, your, your terminal operations and, and your log exports. I think that uh, uh, you know, my philosophy on that is you definitely want to keep that up. And obviously, you want to diversify your your community, but uh, logs and exporting logs has been a fundamental uh, economic stable for this community. And so I want to continue that. I'd like to work with uh, people to have a sustainable uh, uh, timber plan. I think that's really important. You're working on that with the Timber Advisory Committee. I like that. But the, the, the downside on the, on, on the terminal ends of things is discretion and discretionary cargo. Okay, so uh, we have no rail here and we are not next to a major freeway. So uh, those are two really difficult economic challenges not easily overcome uh, as it relates to trying to become more of a terminal operator with cargo, especially cargo uh, that is discretionary in nature. And so I think we need to continue to, to work with the logs and the things that, that, that can make sense for us. Um, but I'm, I'm excited about Marine Terminal. I think the airport, I'm, I'm kind of excited about that opportunity. My philosophy on opportunities there is that the majority of businesses in Walla Walla County and the majority of the businesses in Clown County are very small businesses. Uh, uh, less than 20 is probably 85 to 90 percent uh, in, this, in this county. So with that, I would like to see more of an emphasis on how can we grow small entrepreneurial businesses because small entrepreneurial businesses are the ones who are creating the majority of jobs in the economy today. And I have run very successful small business incubator buildings uh, in Walla Walla. And one of the ones that got the Governor's Award is the Wine Incubator Program. And I just think that we need to focus on entrepreneurship and how can we get small businesses to grow. The key with incubator programs is that it provides affordable, low-cost space for people to come in and take risk 
uh, whether you want to start a welding shop or an HVAC shop or do some type of marine time repair that's complementary to what's coming in here. And I think that uh, we need to focus on trying to help small businesses grow. And if I was uh, so fortunate to be chosen for this job, um, I would be working uh, very much on uh, small business entrepreneurial programs uh, to help the smallest businesses. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, if you can describe your leadership style in dealing with four areas. One first is your staff. The second would be a commission. The third would be our, our tenants or customers. And then the fourth would be the public. So Describe how you do your management slash leadership yeah. style with those four areas. Sure. You know, on the on the staff level, uh, the thing that's always been really important to me with staff is having very well defined uh, job descriptions and to making sure that the staff that I work say, "Yeah, this is the job description, and these are the deliverables." And so uh, I'm big on that. Um, I think staff actually really enjoys that because uh, uh, you have a set of expectations for both for both of you. Um, I'm a big advocate on regular staff meetings uh, at Port of Wall Walls Tuesdays at 10. And it was an opportunity to come in and communicate uh, with all the staff. In particular, I like to communicate what I'm doing, who I'm meeting with, the companies I'm visiting. And I want to make sure the staff understands where I'm putting my priorities and my emphasis. And so um, that's, that's, that's really important for me. And staff comes to those meetings and are able to per participate. Um, in Walla Walla, I had a lot of my mainline staff in my office every day for meetings, and uh, a lot got done going walking and down the uh, aisles talking about projects that we're, we're working on. Uh, the other thing that we did with staff that I thought was very helpful, we may do it here, I don't know, but we have an annual port retreat where the staff puts together uh, an action plan for the following year for the commissioners. And it's a, an action plan beyond just capital expenditures. It's an action plan about what's our business recruitment strategy? What is our marketing strategy? And, uh, and then the other two strategies we put together is uh, we spend a lot of time in Olympia. We, we go after money in the capital budget and we spend time and efforts in, uh, at the federal level as well. The nice thing staff likes about that is they help develop that retreat package material. And we go in as a staff united to the commissioners laying out an action plan for the following year. And then the commissioners and staff get to debate that, and then the electives get to decide where you allocate capital. And it's worked well. So um, that's kind of my, my leadership style with staff. Um, as it relates with the commission, um, I can tell you I've worked for eight different port commissioners uh, and have had outstanding relationships. What I've known about is being an outstanding communicator. In fact, I ran into one of my commissioners a couple weeks ago on the street, and he says, I miss your, Monday, uh, your, your Friday memos because I was always updated on what you were doing and key elements. And uh, so um, I had just great working relationships with all of my port commissioners. And the, and the big thing there, communicating what you're doing, who you're meeting with, and, and what the issues are. I think that's important. The other thing that uh, is just critical is that the port commission has to make sure that the executive director is a trusted advisor. And I've had lots of port commissioners come into my office and say, hey, on this project that I'm working on, here are some community concerns. And so it's great to have that situational awareness of someone coming in and saying, hey, I want you to be aware. So we're able then to package projects and do economic development where we can do some twists and some things to mitigate maybe some of those concerns that the citizens have. And when you have that relationship between a port commission and an executive director to be able to say, look, these are the things that I have concerns with, it, it, it works well. So the most successful ports in the state have the three port commissioners have as their one of their trusted advisors as their executive director of the port. And they do it as a team. So I, I think that's really important. For tenants, uh, the, the, the big issue with tenants is you've got to go out and meet with them and meet with them regularly. And uh, we did that. In fact, one of my economic uh, overall guiding economic uh, rules is that you know we're in a sense a very important economic development agency and, and, and I think you go beyond meeting with tenants. One of the things that the Port of Walla Walla was particularly good at is we had a philosophy to go meet all the largest employers within our county, whether they were a port tenant or not. 
So we'd go meet with Boise Cascade, the pulp and paper mill folks. We'd go out and meet with Tyson Fresh Meats. And you build a lot of support by your port by having someone walk in the door saying, even though you're not my tenant, I care about your business. What can we do to lower barriers? How, how can you expand? And, and in fact, we've got a lot of business leads uh, on your existing businesses who have suppliers that they thought that we should go talk to. So I think it's beyond tenants. I think you communicate with tenants, but you also communicate with your largest employers. I, I, I think that is key. And I've got some really incredible stories about some of our largest employers and the types of meetings we had and what it resulted in. As it relates to the public, um, I think your, your CEO needs to be out and uh, very public. I can tell you that our communication plan at the port is uh, we present it to every service club every year. Uh, throughout the county, whether we had to go to Burbank or Waits, Waitsburg, or the lady back there that knows a little bit about Prescott, we went out and made a presentation every year to every service club to continue to tell them what we do and how we do it, and in particular our budget and what our return on investment is, how many jobs we've created, and all of that. Uh, we do a lot of that. I can tell you that the public just reaching out to the largest businesses adds benefits. We did a community bus tour, which uh, uh, was free but uh, sold out and, uh, every year, a very popular uh, thing to do. And so uh, your CEO needs to be basically, from my perspective, there's a lot of different philosophies about a port executive director and do they come in and are they uh, managers of managers or how to, I think, an effective executive director is your chief marketing person, your chief advocate of the value of your port district. And it's he or she that needs to sell that to the community. It, it's critical. Yeah. Okay, great. Thank you. You've answered some of these. But um, as the port's executive director, what unique strategies would you employ to grow community jobs mm -hmm. and port revenue? Okay. Well, let's talk about that because I think they're both interrelated, okay? So, um, it really gets down to a marketing question, right? How do you market your property and bring people in? And so, one of the things that the Portable Walla Walla did, and I think Portable Lake did this as well, here's the basic tenet, right, with marketing and the assets you have. You need to have something as a port district that somebody else wants, right? I mean, that's kind of the basic tenet. So what Walla Walla did as our economic strategy to grow jobs and grow investment is we wanted to have a lot of inventory, buildings and property upon which people uh, could come in and start a business. And so uh, we were very aggressive in buying property, pre-zoning it, and buying existing buildings as well. You know, I went to your Port Commission minutes of May 5th and uh, was a bit surprised. I mean, you should be complimented for this, but the staff report said that you're at 90% occupancy. That's what the report said, which means you have a 10% vacancy. And in one way, you should be complimented for that. Uh, but uh, my concern is I didn't see a lot of, whole bunch of inventory that uh, we can come in and start plugging new businesses in. Obviously, we've got green trades we're working on, but I can tell you in Walla Walla, we, we bought a host of closed down buildings, whether it be uh, old canning building, old food processing buildings, uh, and we purchased those, and then we went in and repurposed them, broke them up into small spaces, and leased them to new entrepreneurial businesses. It has been a great strategy. And I can tell you in economic development, as relates to business leads, it used to be 20 years ago, you'd get a call and say, what Greenfield site do you have Can we come take a look? I can tell you today, 90% of the business leads, at least that I got at the port, is, hey, we're looking in your area, we need a 10,000 square foot concrete floor building, high ceilings, and we're going to be there in two weeks. Show me what you have in your inventory. Uh, and so I'm a big advocate of having inventory and options, both land to be bought and sold by tenants, and, and existing buildings. And so um, I think that's one of the strategies to bring in more economic development is I think we need to have a broader portfolio. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's uh, 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 a little bit light here. So that, 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 that's one. Um, let me see what else I can think about on that. On and when you say a broader portfolio, you mean of buildings, not of new business lines. Yeah, I, yeah, not necessarily new business lines. I mean, here's my philosophy on, on business lines. I mean, I think there's some things that we can look at in, 
into doing some recruiting in, and uh, obviously uh, you've got marine trades that I think we should focus some work on. I like the idea of the uh, uh, value-added timber. I, I think that makes some sense to, to take a look at that. But um, I like to think out of the box. Um, you know, craft brewery industry is just uh, booming. I know you have some here. Is that something that we can develop a, a cluster for? Uh, and uh, you know, I have some, some other thoughts as well. But um, I, the, the biggest economic development successes that the Port of Walla Walla had was we had something to market. And there was lots of choices in a broad portfolio of properties that were available for people to plug in and play. And uh, that's, where we, that's where we were most successful. I can just tell you the relic story real quick with Commissioner. Uh, Ten years ago, there was a piece of property out by a bee packing plant, uh, and it was being farmed. And uh, I said, this farmer wants to sell it. Uh, it's, on the, it's a piece of property adjacent to the Union Pacific Main Line, and I think we should buy it and put it on an in, you know, inventory. And my commissioners didn't say, did you have a master yeah. plan for it? Do you have a build-out plan for it? They didn't say any of that. Because they agreed with my economic development strategy to be a pre-zoned, ready-to-go industrial property so you can market. And so we bought that. And we sat on it for about three or four years until Relix, which is one of the biggest economic development success stories that Walla Walla County has ever had. This is a produce distribution company that basically loads 55 rail cars of refrigerated produce seals it and in less than five days is in Albany, New York, where 60% of the U.S. population lives. And now they're up to three trains a week. And they've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in that. And they came to us because they said, wow, this site's pre-zoned. It's next to the UP rail line. We have a county zoning that will work with us. It's an outright permitted use. The day that we met them on site, 18 months later, the first train showed up. And so how I think is how many of those do we have within Clallam County, uh, those types of industrial properties or business properties. And so I just want, I want a broad portfolio to be able to, to, to work on. And I did a little bit of research. I know there's not a lot of private industrial sites, but we definitely want to list those as well and work with those property owners as well. Uh, but if you look, asking for clusters or specifics, I mean, the, those ones I previously mentioned are the things I think that would be good targets. Okay. Um, if you think economic development expertise or leadership is one of the strong talents you, you bring to this position, describe how you gained that experience. Or if economic development is not your specialty and understanding it is a very important leadership role here, how would you proceed if hired? And what economic development successes have you been responsible for and are especially proud of? Okay. Well, I, I think economic development as it relates to a skill is, is learned. It's on the job. I mean, you, you don't go to college and take economic development 101. You, you, you work at the bottom level of the rung of the organization like I did at the Port of Benton and you learn and you take the best practices of other ports and other economic development agencies. You steal them, you borrow them, and you use them. So uh, it's, uh, it's just a trade, and I've got uh, 26, well, almost 30 years now in doing economic <coughs> development. So let me tell you about projects, because I'm enormously uh, excited about the projects that we've done. So one of them is that we recruited Clifstar Corporation, uh, a, a juice bottle company, juice processing company to Walla Walla. They make sh uh, shelf-stable, ready-to-drink uh, juices. Um, so, uh, an interesting story, uh, we purchased the port, a closed down food processing plant uh, that hadn't been activated in a long time. Uh, Cliff Star was in the lower Yakima Valley, kind of looking at a site more like Grandview. They did put a call in to us, and again, getting back to the story of having inventory and having something to sell, they said, do you have a, a building of roughly 100,000 square feet, and by the way, um, we do really well in close down food processing buildings. So uh, we were able to, 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 to make that work. And the other thing I'll just tell you is uh, the internet's great and, and I enjoy marketing that, but the old axiom that people do business with people they know makes a lot of sense. Because I flew to Buffalo, New York and met with the owner of the company and we hit it off 
and we closed the deal. So uh, right now, I think there's about 50 employees that work at Cliffstar. The reason why I'm particularly proud of that, we repurposed a building in Walla Walla. And in particular, we created 50 jobs that were uh, uh, what I would call medium wage jobs. And those are so hard to get in today's economy. You have the high, high earners and people that <coughs> don't earn enough to, to, to make it in life. And these are really medium wages uh, for our community. And uh, if you have a good work attitude and can show up and you're drug free, uh, uh, you can work for it. And there's a benefit package, there's also some profit churn. So uh, particularly pleased with uh, Cliffstar and what we've done with that. Um, other examples uh, of specific projects, uh, so we do have marines down, uh, uh, marina type operations in, in Walla Walla County, we're on the confluence of the Columbian Snake, so we actually have grain terminals where we uh, ship about 5 million bushels a year of grain. Uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, we recruited a grain company to the, the Burbank area, uh, we had a grain silo that we owned that was uh, vacant and we went out and it's called the Schooler Company. It's a very good company, uh, highly profitable, and we were able to uh, really uh, add a lot of additional revenues to the port through uh, a really good lease with that facility. Talking about revenue generation, I mean, one of the things that I've always told the commissioners uh, is that a good executive director uh, will do enough business deals that he or she will pay for themselves, bring in enough revenue uh, to, to pay for them. And so one of the big deals that I did was Boise Cascade in the western portion of Walla Walla County had a fiber farm. Uh, it was about 3,000 acres. Uh, and we came to find out that the fiber farm uh, was just not profitable for them. Fiber farms now where you grow popular trees, mm -hmm. you got to be in 10, 15, 20,000 acres to have economies of scale. So we agreed to go and buy this fiber farm of 2,000 acres to cross the street from the mill. And we've zoned it to industrial development and uh, for heavy industry, and we've gotten a lot of good business leads. But what came with that, and I knew, was a very large water right. <laughs> I heard about that one. We took the water right, baked it, uh, banked it in the Columbia River uh, pool, and then leased it to the Department of Ecology for five hundred thousand dollars a year. <laughs> for doing nothing. For doing nothing. So it's like the best line of business ever. <laughs> yeah. We have the right, uh, we have the right commissioners and the flexibility to pull that out if we get a big economic development lead. So I'm particularly proud of that. Just a couple of others uh, that um, the port excelled at, and again, this is port commissioners and staff, so this is not Jim Coons, it's a team effort. We formed some coalitions that turned heads in, in the state of Washington. One was the U.S. Highway 12 Coalition. When I got there, there's this long dream of a four-lane freeway from Walla Walla to the Tri-Cities. We were killing way too many people on that. And uh, it was my idea to form a Highway 12 Coalition that the city, the county, the port, and private folks put money in a pot and we parked ourselves in Olympia and we parked ourselves in Washington, D.C. saying we need funds to make this happen. There's eight construction phases and we've got seven of them funded. Six of them built and another one got funded in the last transportation package. And we're making huge progress on that. Nobody thought 20 years ago... No, nobody thought uh, uh, 20 years ago that we were going to be able to get that uh, together. The other one that was a coalition effort, I want to talk just briefly about preservation of commercial air service. This is quite a story. So we had the, the, the Q200s for a long time. That's the, I think it's the 47 passenger airplane. We had four flights a day. Uh, then we had three flights a day. And then Alaska Airlines introduced that we're going to have the Q400, the 74 passenger, 78 passenger airplane. Came to the poor wall wall, owner, owner and operator wall at regional airport, and says, You know, we're going to take you down to two flights a day, and we are not convinced as an airline that you can fill up all the seats. I think at least there's going to be too much capacity. We have an 80% uh, load factor we want. Uh, you can try, but we're just telling you uh, we're going to give you a chance. And so the port did basically three things uh, that worked exceedingly well. One is we rallied the community and the businesses and the banks and the hospitals uh, to use the Walla Walla Regional Airport whenever possible. Remember, we have competition. You can drive to the Tri-Cities. 
and you're basically uh, 60 minutes away. So we basically told the community, if you want commercial air service, you're going to have to use it. And uh, we have a lot of advertising, and, and one of the things that helps us is we have free parking. When you go to the Pasco Airport now, it's 10 bucks a day. So if you're gone for a week, that's a pretty big bill. Community rallied behind that and started utilizing the airline service. The other thing we did of the three-point plan, and the second thing we did, was, uh, and we didn't have to do this, but we did it for strategic reasons, is we lowered Alaska Airlines prices, both in landing fees and building rents. We lowered them. They didn't ask us to lower them. We lowered them, because we wanted to reduce their operating costs. And that was one of the most toughest votes that the Port Commission ever took, because two days before that Port Commission meeting, Alaska Airlines announced record profits. <laughs> record. It's a little difficult. But mm -hmm. we had done our homework. Mm -hmm. And Alaska Airlines judges every market by itself. And we read the financial analysts in Wall Street. And they raved about Alaska Airlines because every market has to stand on its own. And there's some communities, uh, they don't have air service today because they didn't get that message. And so we lowered the rates. The other thing, politically, we did think that they would pull out after the community decided to lower the rates. The third thing we did, and I think Alaska knows this, and uh, um, is that we met with our congressional delegation, Senator Murray, Senator Cantwell, and Kathy McMorris Rogers, and said, this is what we're doing to try to retain air service. And it was right at the time that a big FAA reauthorization bill was uh, being redone. And uh, uh, Brad Tilden was in the office of Senator Murray and Senator Cantwell and Kathy Forrest Rogers. When he came in to talk about what he needed out of the FAA bill, I was able to get my entire delegation to say we'd be happy to work with you on the types of things you want. One of them was a direct flight from Portland to Reagan. And at the end of his conversation, they said, and by the way, we have something we'd like to have from you. We do not want to read in the local newspaper that you reduced commercial air service in southeastern Washington. So that was our three-point plan, and it's worked. And passenger boardings are record highs now. So the other thing I just want to talk about, I know we get some other questions, is that I am particularly proud of the Walla Walla Regional Airport Business Park. So it's a World War II facility. We have like 80 buildings out there. And one of the things I'm most proud of is the small entrepreneurial businesses that have been able to go out there and start a business. Uh, and it's really important. And we have gotten a lot of minority utilization, including the Hispanic community that are some of the hardest working people you'll ever meet. I've got one tenant that is a wine incubator tenant. He works in Mattawa. He works in the fields, grape fields in Mattawa. And then when he has time, he drives to Walla Walla to make wine because that's his passion. And he's able to do it at the Port of Walla Walla because we have a wine incubator program. And his wine is outstanding, and he's a, he's a rock star. And so, yeah, I'm happy working with the big companies, but I get just as much success walking by a business and seeing two, three people out there welding or doing something, making wine or crafting beer, and saying, you know, I have something, something to do with that. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the Port would like to do a better job communicating and partnering with our community. Any thoughts on what you would do to provide leadership in those areas? Okay, so community in general, or community and other elected officials, or do um, we have... Community in general, okay. um, most the public, uh, not so much. I mean, I, I guess other elected officials is important as well. Okay. So maybe you could take a stab at each, each little one. Okay. Well, let's talk about elected and the other bodies, both the county and the cities and, and all of that. Uh, well, we started in Walla Walla, and I don't know if this is something that would work here. Uh, we started what's called the Executive Alliance. And so once a month, uh, at a certain place, uh, we all met for lunch, and it was the executive director of the port, superintendent of the schools, city manager, county administrator if you have one, we don't, we have a county commissioner come, uh, president of our community college. And we sat down 
uh, once a month and we shared ideas. And I would talk about what's happening in the Port of Walla Walla and the types of things we're doing. The school superintendent would talk about how things are going in the school district, if they're about ready to, to put together a bond issue, whether it be an M&O or a geo bond, and, and we would give them ideas of how to help with that. Um, our, our, our president of community college, Steve on Isledale, would be at all those meetings. We talked about workforce training. So I would like to see if we could get an executive alliance put together that I could have those weekly meetings with uh, people in, in, in similar organizations. I think that's... I think that's really important. As it relates to the general community, um, it's a real challenge. And uh, I think there's some things we can do. But you know, my, my general philosophy is, and this is the same thing at the Port of Walla Walla that, that we worked at a fairly high level, the citizens that we represent that are in our port district uh, have a lot of things that are a lot more important to them than ports, even though you and I love ports. They have kids that got to get to school, they've got soccer matches, and so, the majority of our public is not focusing on what ports do. And, it's, and so it's difficult to, to get over that. And all you can do is continue to have a forward-thinking communication strategy, the bus tours, the executive director speaking to every single service club there is. I really like your community partners program that you put together as it relates to uh, uh, building out uh, resources and all of that. And, you know, and the other thing that's the Port of Walla Walla is countywide. You guys are countywide. So we've got to get strategies also to make sure that CQ, the Forks, and all of those communities, we actually have a responsibility to deliver economic development services. So if I'm selected, I'm going to have a 90-day plan. And one of the things that uh, I will present to you in a 90-day plan is a huge community outreach. I want to be able to meet with all elected officials. I want to go to Forks. I want to go to Squim. I want to go to all of these places. Uh, to communicate my interest in doing economic development with them, and uh, hopefully we can we can make make that work. So, thank you. Okay. Yeah. So, campaign and candidate statements often focus on creating new jobs, mm -hmm. but the best jobs are often those that are already exist. Mm -hmm. What will you do to support the retention and success of existing port dependent businesses <coughs> in the marine timber? composites, and ship maintenance sectors. Please be specific as possible regarding your strategies for these business areas. These are questions that came from the public. Sure. Next yeah. So uh, to me, retention of what you have is the highest economic development program you can have. It is beyond business recruitment and the, and the other things we do. You retain what you have. So the first thing you do, whether it's your existing tenants or the major employers, is it's just business outreach. You're speaking with them and you're talking with them into finding out how their business is going and what the obstacles are. If there are barriers to their success, uh, for instance, it could be an environmental permitting issue or maybe it's an issue with the city or the county, the extent that we can go in under reasonable circumstances and uh, uh, help uh, and influence that, we should do that. Now, we all know that we have tenants that have certain lease rates and they want to renegotiate lease rates, and I'm perfectly aware of the issues related to buying land and not buying land. Those are port commission decisions. I found an executive director decision on that. But uh, if you know your tenants well and they respect you, uh, you'll have meetings often and you'll pick up the phone quite often, like I did with my tenants, to figure out how are things are going. Is there anything that we can do to help? And that's the way you do business retention. I'll just give you uh, a story. Uh, as part of our business outreach, we went to Martin Archery uh, basically every year. Martin Archery is a uh, several generation uh, bow manufacturer in Walla Walla County. Uh, a couple years ago when we went, they said, Jim, things are not good. Um, we're probably not going to make it, and the bank's going to take us over, and we're going to probably lose about 50 jobs. Uh, but I had that relationship. So I went to the commissioners and said, we're going to lose a business. And they said, okay, how? what can we do not to lose the business? And so one of the things was for the port to spend about a million dollars buying the building that Martin Archery is on and then leasing it back to a brand new business who decided to buy Martin Archery to see if they could save it. And it was a risk. Uh, but uh, guess what? Uh, that company is alive. They have about 50 employees, sales are doing good, and we had 
a business retention success story. Now, I don't know if they're going to last another 10 or 15 years, but as the you know, local newspaper said, they did an editorial and they said, you know, the port's taking a risk, a calculated risk, but they're out doing something. They're out trying to save jobs, and that's worth uh, our admiration to do. And I hope they're successful, but if they're not, they didn't just sit there. They tried to make a difference. And I, I think uh, uh, that's, that, that's really important. So we usually have a tenant appreciation opportunities as well. That's why we try to highlight tenants. I think that's important. You have a newsletter. We have a newsletter. We always try to get our, our tenant profiles in our newsletters. Uh, in fact, there's a great story a couple of years ago. We had a small business up at the airport. It was basically a paint shop for old restored businesses and uh, didn't do a very good job advertising. And, and we put him in the port newsletter and he said his phone rang off the hook because people didn't know that this is what he did and where it was at. And so that was kind of neat to, to promote that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. What changes? Yes. Oh, yes. good. Okay. What changes do you expect to make at the airport to better serve the current users? Again, this is from the public. Yeah. Bearing in mind, we are no longer an air carrier airport. Well, um, first of all, we want to be an air carrier airport, right? So mm -hmm. I think that's 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 goal one, and it looks like it's coming. And uh, I will give you one one concept on the air carrier status before I get into the GA, because I think it's a GA question. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I would really like to see, and I know we're not going to be able to do this initially, but you know the lines at SeaTac Airport are a real issue. Mm -hmm. And so my biggest concern, uh, and TSA doesn't have the staff now, so I'm not here to say, but it, my biggest concern is flying here, being dropped off at SeaTac, getting on the ramp, being escorted back into the security screening, and having a two-hour uh, wait to get through. So I think one of the things that, and maybe you've already done that, is any type of expedited screening or a separate line coming from Port Angeles would be critical. Because uh, if they get in the two hour line, uh, people are just going to drive. Mm -hmm. And I would really like to see longer term if we can do it. I know you have Homeland Security out there. I would love to see a way to get some resources, even if the port had the help, just get some TSA agents there and screen them here, then life gets really easy. And that's one of the big advantages in Walla Walla, I'll be honest with you, is you pass through security screening in Walla Walla, and you're there, you land in SeaTac an hour later, you're home free. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that's important. Let's go back to GA. Uh, uh, you know, general aviation is, is tough. I and mean, um, some people may have not heard me speak about this, but yesterday I went out to the airport just to kind of take a tour, a self-guided tour, and then today I got a guided tour. And neither of the times that I was there did I see an airport either land and or take off. So uh, uh, GA is, is difficult, as you know, for many people, that's discretionary income. And so GA uh, does well and doesn't do well based on how the economy is doing. Um, I don't have a lot of great uh, ideas with GA. I mean, obviously, you own hangers there, and hopefully your hangar rates are, are reasonable. Uh, I know you have a GA uh, advisory committee. I think that that's, that's good to get their input of the types of things that they think can make a better environment. Obviously, you want to have an FBO. You have an FBO out there. Uh, you need to have fuel available. You have fuel available there. I don't know if people complain about the fuel prices. They do in Walla Walla on occasion and what it costs. <coughs> to them, but, um, uh, I don't have any magic bullets for how to enhance uh, and thrive a GA airport in a small rural community. Uh, it's just uh, it's difficult just trying to get more pilots out there and, and uh, trying to get uh, uh, more activities, but it's uh, that, that's a tough one. Thank you. Uh, the other thing, just real quick, mm -hmm. uh, that maybe the GA pilots would like is um, without commercial air service, obviously you're going to lose your entitlement monies with the Federal Aviation Administration. So that basically puts you in a pot that's called discretionary funding, and sometimes you'll get it, sometimes you won't, and uh, uh, getting commercial air service back gets you back in the entitlement pot, mm -hmm. which is basically a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. And 
to the extent that we can talk with GA pilots to say, here's our airport master plan, here are the ways that we're going to expend this money, uh, maybe we help the GA uh, pilots help us decide where that goes, consistent with the FAA rules and regulations for security capacity. Yeah. Uh, describe a situation in which you motivated your uh, your team or your department uh, to exceed expectations, and what did you what strategy did you use to do that? Okay, and you're talking more of the staff. More of the staff at the staff level. Yeah. Kind of thing. There's probably lots of different uh, examples. Um, I'm particularly proud of uh, some of the coalitions that we have put together as a staff and um, as, a, as a community. And I guess uh, the one that I want to speak about uh, is the retention of jobs at the Washington State Penitentiary and uh, what happened there. So we have the State Penitentiary that has very old architecture. And so the problem with old architecture is you have corners. And so it takes more staff upon which to have high security prisoners overseen. State of Washington was in the process of cutting budgets and we saw on the horizon that one of our old units was going to close down and we we're going to lose about 300 jobs. And these are again, these family wage, middle class jobs that are disappearing in America. And so we knew that we were in trouble. And so through this coalition and our economic development group and all of that, uh, we decided uh, that we were going to go to the legislature and say, look, we want to become a more costly, cost-efficient facility. And we know the state is looking for some additional uh, high security housing and medium security housing. And so we're raising our hand that we'll take the next, next investment. So we worked the state capital budget very hard and worked with our legislators and I think it was a $300 million appropriation that we got and those new security facilities were built that were high efficient and low cost per day to manage. We were able to take these jobs that are about ready to be eliminated and move them over to a brand new facility. And that was a huge win. We went from losing 300 jobs to retaining 300 jobs. And uh, uh, our community rallied, my staff rallied, and my port commissioners rallied. There's a lot to do at the port. And, uh, one of the things that's most important is the port commissioners have to set priorities. Uh, and my commission said, you need to pay attention to the penitentiary, Jim. You and your staff need to rally this so you can make that a safe. I am particularly proud of that. And uh, what's nice is walking downtown and having a correctional officer come up and say thank you. We know what you did. So. Thanks. So. Okay, so we have 11 minutes left here. So do well, I need to be shorter on my questions? I like to tell stories. No, you're doing good. <laughs> okay. From what you know about us thus far, what three to five priorities would you propose for yourself for the first 90 days as the executive director. You told us about one. Yeah, one is I want to get out and I want to meet with uh, all the elected officials that uh, we do business with. I think that's uh, important. Uh, I want to be able to meet, uh, if, I, if I can, um, every tenant of the, of the port, uh, including the airport. I, I, I just think that's critical. Um, I also want to get fully debriefed on the commercial air service status because if there's anything that I can do to help bring that back, uh, uh, I, I would want to. Um, I know that the site where the Marine Trades Facility is going is now clean, as I've, as I've been told. Uh, I want to immerse myself in that because there's a master plan going on for that, and I want to be intricately involved on how that Marine Trades Facility is going to get developed. And in particular, I want to know what the business targets are. Because one of the things that I think will be very beneficial is you learn from others. And I would really like to uh, uh, go to other communities in Washington and outside of Washington that has the same demographic population we have and to look at very successful marine trade districts and to figure out what commonalities they have, what skills they have, what services they have. And then I want to come back here and see if we can replicate that. And I know that's moving and I just, that that's going to be a high, a high priority. Uh, the other thing is 
uh, for me, I, I would want to look and figure out where our capital projects are uh, and get a good sense of that. Very high priority is de debrief with staff or who's working on what. I, I like, I developed in Walla Walla, it's called a master project list, which is a list of all the projects we're working on, who's responsible for doing it, and when the deliverables are. And I, and I just think that's, that's really important. I want to make sure that, uh, uh, that um, uh, we talked a little bit about that as, as well. So most of the types of things that I would focus on uh, initially. Thank you. Another question from the public. Okay. As the new executive director of Port, Port Angeles, Will you make it a priority to provide videos of Port of Port Angeles work sessions and business meetings to the internet for the taxpayers of Clallam County to view when they have time in their schedules? Yeah. It's not an executive director decision. It's a decision by the three elected port commissioners and I will honor their decision. Executive directors don't make decisions on those elected officials. Okay, thank you. Uh, of our lines of business that you kind of you've already toured yeah. and that, which one of them do you see the opportunity with the most low-hanging fruit for helping our local economy? Yeah, well, marine trades is, is definitely. I mean, you already have a basis of some of that there, and looking at some of your businesses there, so uh, that's going to be a high priority. Uh, and then, um, obviously. Uh, the airport and getting commercial air service is, is going to be a big business opportunity. And, um, and then from there, I, I really want to meet with some of your largest employers and kind of get a feel, uh, Commissioner, of where they're at and are there some abilities to grow their businesses and create some more jobs. So. Describe some things that you would do to maximize the level of staff commitment, motivation, performance, excellence, and pride. Okay. Well, the, the best thing that an executive director can do and the three commissioners can do for any type of staff is you set clear priorities and clear deliverables of what we want to get done as an organization. And I know there's a lot of competing interests out, but uh, you've got to prioritize what it is that you want to get done. And if the commissioners can prioritize, uh, to the executive director and to staff, then that should motivate us because then we know uh, how we define success. And that's, that's what's really important is to really get clear definitions of where you want to go. And when we come out of our budget retreats every year, uh, staff feels really good because these are clear expectations for the following year and the types of, the types of things that we're going to do. You know, I also think with talented staff and people that work hard, uh, you got to thank them, and you've got to say, hey, that was really well done. And I always tried uh, to tell staff when they did really good staff work, uh, I would uh, 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 tell them, uh, not only privately, but uh, I made it a point uh, in front of the port commissioners in a meeting that so-and-so did this work, and I thought it was really uh, well done. And I, just, uh, I, think, I think that's important. But for staff to be motivated, for staff to uh, produce, uh, there has to be clear priorities set by the Port Commission of what the expectations are. And if you'll do that, then, and, and I have worked with all of my commissioners to do that. We've had commission meetings and, and uh, I'm often known as, okay, let me repeat back what I just heard so that I have a clear understanding of exactly where we're setting priorities. And I would, I would suggest to you that uh, some of the most effective ports in, in, in the state set clear priorities and, and execute them. And, and, and the thing that is a challenge for ports, cities, counties, chambers, EDCs, is a lot of people want you to be all things and do lots of things. And so what happens is you don't resource correctly and you do a whole bunch of things marginally well. That really doesn't serve the interests of the public very well, in my view. And when you have to say no, and I know this from an elected official's position, you have to say no to a person who may have a perfectly good idea for the port to say, I like that, I recognize it, I value your input, but we're going to do one, two, and three, and we're probably not going to do four, or at least in the foreseeable future. Um, that's hard, but sometimes it needs to be done. Um, well, there's two more that we have to ask the others, yeah. and I will ask one. Okay. How do you deal with failure? 
Well, I think failure, uh, uh, to me, uh, actually it's part of the process of doing economic development. I mean, there are a couple of bis business leads that I thought that we were going to land some big companies only to have them call me and say, you know, Jim, I thank your efforts for the last six months, but um, we're not coming. And one of the businesses was Procter & Gamble. We, uh, we worked with them really hard on uh, setting a tissue plant across the street from the Boise Cascade paper mill. And uh, we put our a lot of time and effort in that, all for them to say that they're going to Utah. And uh, Utah gave them a huge incentive package. And so, um, you know, that just resolves me to, to go on to the next project and try to make a difference. But you're going to have failure in this business, and you're going to have some days that aren't, aren't the best of days, and you've you got to rally from those and, and learn and move on from them. How do you guide your staff through that failure? Oh, it's, uh, we meet and uh, basically you do a post-mortem and say, okay, this is, this is where we're at, this is why we didn't get the business. Um, was there a way that we could have sharpened our pencils, there's things that we could have done differently? If the answer is no, then it's an opportunity to say, thank you for working so hard on this project, I'm sorry it's not going to go forward, but there's another one down the road that we are going to land. And so, uh, it's just something you do. And we've had... You know, the other thing is that we've, um, when there are failures and all of that, I think it's really important for the executive director to speak up and say, you know, the buck stops with me. I wish we would have landed it. Mm -hmm. If you're unhappy, it's the executive director. And uh, you need to do that. That's just part of the job is when there's bullets to be taken, the executive director should be taking those bullets, not staff. Okay, thank you, Jim. So we have three minutes left, and I'm, we've got two last questions. Okay. Is this your exit job from your working career, number one? And number two is, do you have any questions for us? I do have a, questions, uh, a question for you. Uh, for me, uh, again, I've got about 10 years left. Uh, my track record is finding a place I like and staying, right? 26 years at the Port of Walla Walla. There's enough challenges here that uh, this is a job that I think I could do for quite some time. This is, uh, <laughs> this is uh, we got a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. 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 yeah, that's your criteria. You'll be here a while. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so my question for you is this: You know that you've hired the right executive director because in six months he or she has done what? You've hired the right executive director. Well, I mean, going, I, go ahead. Uh, I, I think at six months it delivered a clear 90-day um, assessment of our priorities and goals from the executive director perspective co coming back to us saying here's where I see everything let's 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 go from here okay. and so that we get a good read on where we're at okay. For me, it is that we are short-staffed at our management level, and so it's very important for us to, to fill those gaps on our, our second level of our organizational chart, okay. which is very open. We've been waiting for our new executive director to work with us to set that organizational chart. So that has first and foremost importance. Okay. Also reaching out to the entire county, all the electeds, and then, you know, a lot of what you said. Uh, we're at a point in time when we need some unity in our, in our county to make everybody feel happy about where we're going. Okay. And so we're all these little satellites, and, and so it's really important for us to reach out and be transparent and, and try to be the unifier in the community. You know, in addition to everything else we need to do in trying to get that airline in here and, and, and get going on our k fly site. So, and, and you're exactly right. We have a lot of things on our plate right now, and we do need to prioritize. And, and so we're waiting for that new ED so that we can sit down and get those things prioritized. Thank you. I would say if you were able to say to this commission in six months from today, I have worked with the executives of the different economic development agencies in our county and the municipal governments, and we have collectively decided we are going to go after this one win together, and this is our plan to do that as a, as a county, as a community. Okay.
thank you. That's valuable input. That, that, that helps. Well, great. Well, thank you very much. I think that uh, wraps things up. We really appreciate yep, you